Okay, welcome to braid meeting number four. Uh, so I guess I'll, so we have a new thing this time. Let me just click it. Okay, so um, last Wednesday or Thursday, Seth led us through defining our work. So now we can go through status updates with all of the stuff that we know that we're doing, which is nice. As we're doing more stuff, we can update it here and this will give us all an overview of where our priorities are and how we're coordinating our efforts. Um, then we have a couple little demos. We have probably less demo work today than the last times. And so I think we'll have a bit more open space for discussions overall. And so we can talk through Braid uh, HTTP 03 issues. Um, I wanna talk through IETF a little bit, but I expect this to be a bit more of a relaxed meeting. Um, I am kind of excited about this library um, that will let us write braid code. And so I'm gonna to wanna to get a review on it. I'll just show you how you use it. I'm hoping this can be something that lots of people will be interested in using. So I'm looking for feedback on the release. Uh, but let's click into our work. Great. Okay, so this is our, our work page. Um, I think maybe we could just talk through this, get, remind ourselves of an overview here. And then I'd love to hear individual status too. Um, and we could also include that on here. So I think overall in the Braid project, when I'm looking at the big picture, um, two years ago, I think, or, or last year, we were working, we we're just working on the specification. So I think uh, previous, like maybe early, early, it's been a bunch of us building things independently of our own accord. And then, we started to think, okay, maybe we can make a standard of this. And uh, I remember, so I, I went with Seth to IETF and we talked to the IETF people and we're trying to figure out how does the standard process work. And we figured that the first step we got to do is write everything down in a spec that like at least the first draft that we think might make sense. That way we can deliberate it. And we've got a pretty good draft of that now. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot bit more that we're working through. And um, the Braid project as a whole, the homepage is really, is mostly just talking about the specification. It's talking about HTTP protocol and all these features it's adding. And um, everything's talking about the standard. But now that this is going, we've been doing a lot of development. And so it's feeling like a big focus in our group is focusing on use now. Um, so like we're talking about writing motivating use cases for all the different aspects of the protocol spec so that we know like why are, why are these features here? And that'll help us deliberate them. Um, we're also, and this is this package I'm talking about. I'm gonna release this package that should make it easy for other people to use the protocol in their projects. And I think we'll probably wanna be revising the homepage. Um, so it's not just about protocol and theory, but how you can use Braid. Um, so, so we've got these to-dos overall, like orienting Braid around use. We've also got a bunch of spec work that's ongoing. There is, um, we've got a bunch of issues still remaining in Braid HTTP 03. Let's take a quick look at that. Um, so we're 15% you know, complete, um, which means we've closed two things. We've got 11 open. Some of these are both issues and pull requests. So we can close them both at the same time. Um, so it might look like more things than there actually are. And I'm thinking we might, if we have some time at the end, we can go through these things. Could be nice to hammer that down. And um, then there's some, as we've been discussing the spec, um, you know, Seth and I in particular have had a lot of big debates about deep topics. How do we represent versions? How do we represent patches? And we still have some more work to do on that. This will, I'm guessing this will make its way into version four, probably not version three. And um, a lot of that is uh, thinking about mapping between different models of like versioning and how do we how do we think about these things? We're noticing we're using different terms for stuff, so we want to make a glossary. And then we've also got this Redwood implementation that Brad's been Bryn's been working on, and it's uh, we want to pull this into the fold and make sense of uh, there are some things which might have different names in Redwood, and there are some features that we have don't have in the spec. And so it'd be nice to go through and find out what's the same and what's different and organize our work so that we can bring that into the fold. Uh, we've got a number of, we've got some things to do for our organization itself, 
like the consensus process is currently a bit unclear. How do we decide which changes make its way into the, into the spec? How do we resolve differences? We've been talking this entire time about modeling ourselves after the IETF process, and in fact, becoming an IETF working group or merging with an existing working group. Um, thus far, we are a separate group because we haven't exactly figured out the best way to do that. Um, but the IETF meeting is coming up, I think, is it next week or something? The latest one, meeting 110? This patch? Yeah, maybe. It's coming up very soon. Um, and there's a, there's a hackathon there that we'd like to participate in. And um, they also have this big event called Dispatch where you can come with a new idea. And there is a group called Dispatch uh, that's like, you know, a bunch of people show up there and they try to figure out where does this new idea go in the IETF? How do we handle it? Do we place it into a, an existing working group? Do we make a new working group out of it? So that might be a good thing for us to go through at some point. Um, just IETFs this week and the hackathon was over the weekend. So. Okay, so we totally missed it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so I'm thinking maybe for the next one, we can get more integrated. And the next step there might be just to contact some people. Um, okay, another thing is um, we're kind of doing this Braid Foundation, which is uh, putting some money down to develop things. Um, we might want to have an internship or a process. I've been talking to a college student, uh, Gilia, who wrote the Haskell implementation. You might want to intern with us. There's also, um, we could do bounties, you know, or have some kind of grants or something to help develop out the ecosystem. Um, and um, the antimatter algorithm that I keep showing uh, needs to be explained and published. And so uh, for my personal priorities, um, right now I'm trying to get this use going. So work on the library, working on the homepage, and then I'm also, I want to want to get this algorithm published. Um, how about anyone else? Um, I'd love to hear other people's general status, what are you up to? And um, are there changes in our group or like, you know, different priorities that you think we should be doing or are there things that I'm missing about what we're up to or what we should be up to? I can report briefly on the meeting Seth and I had. Um, we, uh, in our meetings uh, page down below, I don't know if you can probably see those, um, we uh, intended to meet to talk about the um, Braid Protocol library. And um, we had a, a good discussion around which pieces belong in a sort of a, a very basic Braid, like using the same vocabulary as the Braid Protocol spec um, library, a very basic library that does what, what the spec says. And then a kind of higher level, uh, an outcome of this discussion is that we're gonna split it into a lower level and higher level library. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of excited about that. I think there will be uh, some nice effects that come out of splitting it, such as um, being able to use the lower level library as, for example, an alternative to WebSockets, or um, you could do something like um, uh, uh, add, add patches without any kind of complicated um, syncing library. Um, it could be just really basic uses like that. But I expect that the longer term benefit will be uh, turning it into something like a, a, a base layer for kernels to be built on. Did I cover everything, Seth? Is there anything else that? Yeah, um, I also just want to briefly mention that idea of splitting it into two different libraries is Mike's idea originally. And um, I think he was right about it. Um, so credit where it's due. Uh, and um, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, and then the other part is just the, the point of the higher level library is like, you know, I, I just want to, I just want to know what the value of that URL is and tell me it and tell me anytime it changes and the higher level library should be able to handle reconnections and be able to like, you know, update with versions and uh, do a bunch of those kind of more complicated things. But yeah. Cool. Great. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I'm working on such a library. So we'll get to review that idea later on in this meeting. Anyone else want to talk about anything you've done?
or are up to? I mean, I, I would say something, but I, I'm in the, I'm slotted in the agenda. To... Briefly mentioned that I've been working on, I spent Thursday, Friday working on my Rust implementation of, um, uh, of Braid. Um, and anyway, I pulled out Tide and thrown in Actix and spent a couple of days learning how Actix works and, uh, and like the message passing library separately from Actix web. And anyway, I've got a really simple um, like Rust Braid implementation with Actix working now. Um, but importantly, I, you know, should work so that I can like send a message to a URL, like send a message to a container for a URL and then that'll broadcast out to all of the um, active clients that are subscribed to it and, you know, do all the braid things, which is surprisingly difficult to get working correctly, um, partially because, you know, Actix automatically scales across the C across the CPUs and so on. So, you know, objects are going through like concurrency boundaries and all sorts of things. In the what library. is Actix? But, yeah. Um, Actix is a uh, an active framework for Rust. So, um, it's yeah, it like act, yeah, it's an active framework for Rust uh, where you've got different objects that can message pass between each other. Um, and it was built originally. Um, it was built and then the author wrote Actix Web, which is I think still the highest performance web framework in the world, like in any language on any system. Um, like and it, it like smokes the competition on uh, the tech and power benchmarks. But um, Actix Web has since been rewritten to not even not use the lower level Actix library and just the pure high performance HTTP library. But um, anyway, I don't know. I, I'm using both of them for a little braid demo because I can use the Actix Web stuff to, as the web front end and then Actix itself to do message passing between uh, um, in order to broadcast out updates and so on. That's the idea. Sweet. Yeah, oh. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I can uh, give an update on something I talked about uh, prior. I finally got the uh, uh, the reading of the Braid version two protocol done, uh, published cool. on YouTube. I, I'm gonna, it's still unlisted right now. I wanna give it just one overview of the render recording, just to make sure I haven't included any uh, mishaps uh, in it. But yeah, that'll uh, go public later today. So reading of it and then with commentary uh, for beginners every now and then uh, into it. So at least that's a uh, experiment that will be interesting to see whether or not reading our pro protocol specifications is uh, interesting compared to just research papers, which is what the channels are usually done. That's, that's pretty cool. I'm, uh, a big part of our work, I think, is going to be evangelizing and explaining to other people. And so this, this feels like one of the first efforts in that area and uh, a nice experiment to see how the protocol lands. I was surprised, um, by the way, last, I think it was Friday, uh, a, a graduate student, Jeffrey Litt, who's been working in, uh, with PVH on Cambria, posted something on Hacker News about bring your own client. It was a nice blog post. And in that uh, discussion, somebody linked to Braid and they linked directly to the protocol spec, uh, which, you know, not, not the homepage or anything, not like a, something designed to be easily digestible, but the spec itself. So it's, it's interesting um, seeing how making the technicals uh, accessible might be valuable. So that's cool. Um, oh yeah, and very briefly, um, just to loop back. So last week I mentioned that um, I wanted to have a test suite for Braid. I wanted to have a, a set of different worked examples of the Braid protocol itself. and. Um, so I got started with this uh, last week. Um, so this is the braid dash test suite repository and the braid org. So I want these to be like examples that we can run against all of our different implementations, um, which is similar to Mike's test to server. Um, uh, I think there's like an interesting relationship between these different parts, but um, yeah, but I made like the simplest possible, like, you know, requests to describe keep alive and then response um, sending back like some updates without patches, but uh, and then I was going to write the the patch version, which uses patches and versions, and then patches and versions, and then doing operational transform. Um, I feel nervous that I'm going to get it wrong in some way. Uh, so Mike and I, and you can see it on the Braid work page. Um, Mike and I, and maybe Dwayne, anyone who's interested, um, I, I want to like I want to pair write some you know a handful of examples um, with the spec that uh, hopefully are correct and that we can all use as reference references to be able to make sure that our own implementations are doing everything correctly. So yeah, so that exists and feel free to, um, yeah, 
submit pull requests and things like that. Great. Yeah, Maybe. that sounds pretty useful. I was just writing up some test cases yesterday. <laughs> oh, cool. Great. <laughs> nice to, yeah, collaborate on that. Yeah. For the uh, test suite, that will be that but rather than just being a specification of expected responses, you could probably do it right as a uh, NPM package that boots up a server or even as a Cloudflare worker where there's actually a live production URL people can uh, in query, right? To then test their implementations yeah. against. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I want to start with a series of examples, um, you know, and like hand testing and then, then automate as we, as we go. But this is the place to start. And also, we need a whole bunch more examples for the spec anyway. Yeah. Actually, it wouldn't need to be a NPM package that would be included that would boot up a server. It could just be like a, a whatever package allows you to run a command line server. So it just boots up a server on a specific port, and then your implementation can query against that port on your local machine, rather than actually having to be embedded within your own implementation's uh, test suite. You could just boot so up. I mean, Mike's already got the tester server written, so I, I'd like yeah. to like extend that with all of this. So you wouldn't even have to spin up your own server, just point at the one that we've already got running. Um, yeah. And that can spit out any protocol areas and things like that. Um, the other part of it though is like, it's not just testing clients, it's also testing servers. So I also want a, you know, like I want a tester for both clients and for servers that will verify that, you know, it's getting the right kinds of messages back and so on. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, Seth, do you want to be working on this test stuff this week sometime? Or like, I guess I'm wondering uh, when we should be collaborating on that or coordinating mm -hmm. on it um, amongst all the stuff that, that you're up to. When, do you have an idea of when you might want to do that? Well, if you scroll down to the meetings we need to have part. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, brainstorming workshop and use cases, the bread protocol Tuesday. So we wrote down here that we'd do it tomorrow. Um, so yes, based on what we said last week. Does okay. that still work for you? Uh, yeah, I was imagining use oh. cases being a little bit different than test cases. Oh, sorry, no, no, you're right, actually. That's not what I meant here. Um, yes, sorry, this should be another entry that we don't have here yet. Um, yeah, I would love to do that this week if you go for it. Okay, You'd look, okay, this week, so like, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, well, <laughs> I guess there's Thursday or Friday, maybe for me, unless we want to mix it in with one of these existing things. Well, that third one's probably, we were talking about doing it after this meeting, potentially, if we both up for it. That's right. Okay. Um, so, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So let's put this on Monday and then uh, mm -hmm. test cases Wednesday. Great. Great. Okay. Well, then this looks like so we've got a bunch of meetings this week. And I think, you know, anyone who wants to work on test cases, we can meet here also and use cases. Looks like we're going to do it tomorrow. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, I, I also want to like, I don't know, I'm very happy just to add things in this week, but um, I'm also really keen for the uh, the other like, oh, I guess we put them on the week of uh, next week. But I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Dwayne doing a code tour of both BraidJS and Braid Protocol um, and some of the other things that we're talking about doing. So I want to be selfishly taking off all the time this week with all the things I want to do, um, just uh, coding with some of it. Sweet. Okay. Uh, any other updates or thoughts about our current work? Then, oh, Angela? I, I've got an update that I could show in a couple minutes. Great. On, on my work. Um, so the theme here is. Uh, um, So the theme here is magic. <clears throat> so uh, you have been talking about Bradifying in multiple contexts. And uh, so I've just been running with that whole Bradify. So I'm just like Bradifying everything I can get my hands on. Um, so you guys can see a couple windows here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I got my ghost to launch sites. So before I was demoing like on port 8,000 local, now I've got angelogliding.com, my chat page. I've got alice.lahacker, bob.lahacker, and carol.lahacker. 
So four different domain or two different domain, different sub subdomains. Um, so I've got the test the braid server down here. I'm going to refresh this page. I'm going to give it angelogladden.com will be, it's like the hard coded host right now. Um, so I'm going to subscribe to this page, uh, the Angelo Gladding version, and I'm going to slowly refresh these because there's still some bugs that are being worked out, but, uh, I think this will work. So I'm on Angelo's side and I say, Hey guys, and ignore that. But so it, it pops up in the same pattern every time, but when I continue to use it, so now I'm on Bob, hello. No, he said hell. Um, so it's working on the first two clients, but for some reason down here, if you see, it's coming in just fine. And this is sort of like my micro formats reduction, if you will. So um, basic, basic, basic. For whatever reason, it like requires a couple of trips to start up. And uh, then it's, you know, fully functioning. I, I, I'm like, yeah, I have to work on some networking stuff. And I've got a question about ping pongs and like how, how quickly and aggressively you reconnect or whatever. Maybe I'll ask those in chat. But so the chat is working and here's the theme, magic. So inside of my code, I'm going to get rid of this for a second. I'm just going to expand that. So this is Braidify in my canopy, which is running all four of those websites. All I do is wrap the app with Braidify, web.braidify. Web.braidify is this function that you see on the screen here. Uh, ignore the yield. It basically just you know, does that stuff to every transaction. So if it, it sniffs a braid connection and when it finds one, it braidifies things. Um, so I did that and let's see, do I have tx.kv? This is what I mean by magic. I don't, I didn't even realize how it was working. So what I do is I create a braid right here. So on a subscribe, I handle cores and then I basically give my server a braid object, which is this. And what I do with every braid object is I connect to a Redis pub sub. So I subscribe on the path that's getting the subscription. And long story short, um, this is the only JavaScript code on the chat template, which is terribly simple HTML, as you can see. Uh, I just have my braid client uh, connect, like I said, hard coded to the host of the chat. And then there's a subscribe. And when you submit the form, there's a publish. And all of that is just sort of like handled transparently because of that Redis pub sub on the back end. The proof is here's my chat handler. All it does is spit out some HTML to get the thing going. So yeah, I was, I was doing a whole bunch of other things and I kind of circled back to this after some fine sandpaper and uh, yeah, the magic presented itself to me. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> so same of the same stuff, but a little more refined and I'm liking the braidification. <laughs> that's cool. Are you, so is, is the Redis stuff, um, is that also uh, sort of the core of your pub sub then so that um, like other notifications and web uh, web postbacks and things are coming from that pub sub? I mean, I had done some WebSocket real time stuff in the past and I had gotten it working with Redis pub sub. So I knew I was just going to use that same pattern here. But from my experience, it's just a really like powerful sort of concept and Redis does it really performantly and reliably and well. Um, but it's like you said, I think, I think you have your own pub sub like implemented in JavaScript in your, in, in some of your server code. Um, it's not a fantastically complicated thing, but um, having it in Redis means it's outside of the process. So I can just sort of like grab it from a background queue. But anyway, um, cool. 
so I can subscribe from any from more places possibly by punting or shoving it into Redis. And it's um, like, let me show you on the machine. I have it right up here. So I'm logged into Redis on my laughing ghost machine, which I'll show you in one second just to wrap it up. Um, uh, I am, okay, entering into the Redis and now I'm going to subscribe to the path. I told you I'm like putting all these subscriptions by path. So if I subscribe to it, and then I clear things up, go back to the chat. Let's see, text. Well, oh, there it is. So, um, you know, that's outside of my app. That's just sort of like on the same server. Um, but OK, so here's, here's the thing. So I refresh this page. So nothing's being stored. So it's just sort of like this sort of like higher level layer where like you're just describing the low level library. I've like got that sort of functioning. Now I want to persist it to the database in versions. So I want to create a resource for this chat and then like append links or something to it so that like the chat itself can be sync uh, merged with other chats, I think is what the second level library you guys are talking about is doing. Oh, and uh, the laughing ghost is probably worth showing. I can find it. So this is the most recent iteration of my sort of like host uh, thing. So I've got Angelo Gladding um, mounted to the Canopy app, which is now like it, it pulls, you install directly from PyPy. And you'll see here that ghost in the machine is uh, the actual like this this UI right here, the single page application, and you, it's behind. So I I need I can click this and it'll update. And I did this yesterday with the canopy, and it actually like updated the code of my website and kept the data in its place. So Braid is going to be accessible, you know. Well, yeah, Braid will be accessible like this, and I'm going to be doing the same thing for npm as I am for PyPy. So you can like create a or spawn, spin off a braid app like one click in theory using and this so this laughing ghost if i'm understanding it um this would be a way that like if you're maybe you're not you don't like writing unix code <laughs> like, like you don't like mucking around in unix but you can click a button and now you have a state store out there in a sense and you can kind of you can read it you can write to it and it'll have some braidly synchronized stuff. Is that kind of the idea with this laughing ghost? No, this is just like uh, website management. So, but it's designed to like, this right here is an app, a micro server, micro subs, micro pub, you've heard me talk about from the indie web. Um, you can just mount this. I, I didn't break something right now because it's still in progress. But like uh, test.com, um, you know, you just sort of add a domain. That's not gonna, you know, I, I, I don't wanna waste too much time, but um, then you can add TLS and then you can mount an app. You could mount the web mention app and it will just sort of like receive web mentions at that URL, which isn't much, but you could make a braid app. <laughs> that does what you're talking about as some sort of like a decentralized DB, or you could just sort of like spin up a website that uses Braid. So like it's a Swiss Army knife, it's general purpose, if you will, just to get a, a, an app, a WSGI app from PyPy or the equivalent from NPM. I have not yet determined what the equivalent of WSGI is in NPM and JavaScript. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to connect here is like I, I get a sense that something in our work with Braid is very relevant to the style of Ghost app. And I'm trying to understand that connection. And maybe the connection, I think what this lets you do is create your own website easily. Like you can put in a domain name, click a button, and it runs a server. 
And one of the things that we often, like we want in this distributed web community is to have our own our own data. And so we wanna have an easy way to run our own servers that provides different functions. And so it looks like all the functions are like these apps on the left, and then you can put the domain names where they're served at the right. And by adding braid to the functions on the left, it's like, now we're gonna add the braid protocol into this kind of indie web, it, you, you get your own thing going. Is that, is that how, you, how you'd see this? Well, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what like braid can be used for, right? I've got my own little chat implementation that I'm actually tangibly working on. Um, I would like to maybe braidify this, if you will, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to speak to outside of use case. Uh, but if you have like a braided, uh, a braid app that you want to give to other people to host, <laughs> you have to like say, okay, go get a server somewhere and install NPM and then install this app and then run it. Oh, wait, now you got to go back to get Nginx and you got to put that in front and oh, wait, you suck. It's not ports, secure everything. This is like a 4,000 line at this point, Python file written like a shell script that gives you a hardened server with this specific functionality out of the box, right? It's not going to be good for a corporate, you know, mega farm that's like doing storage in the NASs or anything. It's for like getting webby code on the web. Yeah. And uh, let, so my braid interest is in the web, but I know that it's extending into other, it's got its fingers in other areas, but uh, I think this is like general purpose enough to keep it in the back of your mind. If you like have some app that you want launched, like ask me if I can't like, you know, one click, one click it for you. <laughs> That's really cool. I've wanted something like this for ages. Um, and yeah, like I explicitly think the Prey to be a great tool. Like I want something that's like, here's the set of server processes running on a server and I can just be like, through something like Braid or, you know, probably through Braid, like delete that one. And I'm like, great, okay, that service, that process is no longer running. Okay, insert this other thing that's like based on this NPM package or this whatever it is, you know, status, like installing, status running, now it's running, you know? And then it's like, shows its configuration, I can just reconfigure it. I mean, I'm sort of locking myself into uh, production pipelining, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I want to like, you know, have this tied in with the major package indexes. Like it's it's going, when I load this page, it's going to making three separate requests to PyPy for each of those packages, grabbing the version feed, finding the last version, and then using the semver comparison to the package on hand. So I'm like walking into weird territory that's outside of the purview of like braid and web but like i just wanted to be able to one click install and yeah. that has its fingers in a lot of different things um yeah but it works now <laughs> that i've like finally <laughs> refactor and uh so i got my angelogladding.com up like trivially so that chat you know it, you could bring a chat app up to dozens of people if, you know, all you need is a DigitalOcean account, um, but it, I tried it once upon a time with Linode and it just worked because all it requires is vanilla Debian at the end of the day, which means you can do it locally with VM. But anyway, the braid chat though is what I'm most interested in. Like I, I've got some ideas on how to persist to disk. I'm gonna be using SQLite on the back end, um, but <laughs> this is what I'm working on now. And I'm going to be walking into C CRDT territory and I'll finish on this. I saw Seth, you and Michael talking with the YJS guy for three hours. I've watched the first 15 oh, yeah. minutes and I was like checking boxes off my questions list. So like, <laughs> the next two hours and 50 minutes is going to read me some more. So I'll watch that before I ask anything more. <laughs> okay. You. See you so. In advance. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Kevin's great. Um, I'd love to ask a little bit more, Angela, about how Redis fits in. Like, could you go through like um, maybe like a request response? Like, where does the the request hit your Python server, and then where does it go to Redis, and then where does that come back out? Um, sure. Let's 
see what I can. Do you have code in Redis? Like, did you write some custom functions that are running, translating those patches around and stuff? That's the magic. Um, so, so do you? Like, I know you know how pub sub works because you've implemented the trivial form in your code. So, I don't know. That's part of the magic for me. Um, so, okay. Uh, Let's start with this. So angelobiting.com slash head slash grade. So when I, when I refresh the page, my JavaScript, as you see here, it subscribes uh, to the itself, right? I'm showing you Angelo Gladding. And when it receives something, it appends it to the DOM. So it's, I reloaded, it's we're now subscribed, haven't received anything yet. Um, and then here's just the form. When I click the button, um, it sends the publish. And publish takes two arguments, the range, right? We're doing the, this whole thing in the jigger. And then the JSON, the, the version ultimately, right? Well, the patch, the patch. We're sending the patch and the patch is a message, a chat message in this case. And that's structured like micro format. So uh, upon subscription, it goes into my framework, which then, like, well, it goes to my Canopy app, which has been braidified. So the app.wrap does every single time you receive a connection, go through all of these wrapper functions and, you know, like do something with the transaction. Um, instead of having a handler do one path, it like does every transaction that hits the machine. It's a common uh, pattern, I believe, in Flask, et cetera. I don't know what they specifically call it. Um, so I've braidified, which means every transaction passes through this function. So on angeloguiding.com slash jazz, that's braid. It sent the subscribe, so it's coming as seeing it's notifying before it handles the bulk of the request it's no it's it's seeing that it's a subscribe so it is initiating the headers for the subscribe ignore this part right here this is what i started on like explicit handlers for subscribe and patch um and then i realized i don't want to do that i want to automatically do it so this is where i'm moving for and i'll fall back i can do some funky stuff with that manually but Right now, it braids on the path. It creates an object to return to the server, and then it ultimately returns the subscription, which is a 309, 209. So that's the 209 status. And then it gives the braid object, which is an iterator object in Python, which sort of like iterates indefinitely, even though the connection has probably already been dropped. They need to fix some server code, uh, some server config, but that's something else. So now we're in this infinite loop, if you will, an iterator that goes on forever. And it just, while true, sleeps until it gets a message from the subscription. So it just tries to get a message forever. And when it gets one, it's a real message and then it does something with it. And so I'm, accept I'm, I'm expecting Jason, I grab the Jason, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this is like all according to the spec at this point. So where does Redis fit in? Is it in that? So this is uh, this is Redis, the tx.kv. That, that's the transaction key, the, this transactions key value database. So, and I'm using Redis. Um, so when I create, so when the subscribe comes in and it's, it's coming in four times for all four of these people, right? So, um, I see. So, so the Python web server is holding open the connection, and then it tells Redis to create a. It creates a pub sub to Redis, and so you've got a chain of client to Python web server to Redis, and then the Python web server process goes to sleep, and then it waits for Redis to wake it back up with some subscription, and then it wakes up and and so I guess each um, request response holds open one thread indefinitely. So I'm using G event. I'm using G event, right. Which greens everything. And as long as it works, it works. And that's some magic on its own <laughs> that I won't claim to know too much about. 
other than I've had tremendous success with it and so have others. And a lot of people still to this day say, go G event. <laughs> so um, so uh, you saw that weird stuff in the beginning. I'm gonna work through some kinks, but I did have early on like 30 different browser windows open with that Colorama thing. And on the local host, it was working pretty gosh darn well. It was working pretty, pretty well <laughs> across more than enough um, different, uh, pr uh, different connections that I imagine as long as some subtleties are fixed, it'll scale pretty well. I look forward to seeing how far it'll scale. <laughs> but part of the reason of having each individual host their own thing is that you only have to scale so much. If every participant is like an equal peer, then the workload goes down, maybe the connection load goes down. It's kind of like social scaling instead of mathematical big O notation scaling. <laughs> Horizontal I, scaling versus vertical scaling, I think, you know, um, like server farms. Um, just, I these two voices in me that are like, sorry, I'm just gonna jump in. Like one of them is like, this is freaking sweet. Like, you know, just get something working. I love it. And there's another voice in me, which is like the, you know, university educated engineer. And I'm like, sleeping for like one millisecond. That's like a hot loop. You're just gonna like peg a whole CPU call with that thing. Like, you know, or at least like have a good attempt at it. Using Redis PubSub, that's going to drop messages, and Redis PubSub doesn't guarantee message delivery order. So, like, if two things come in at once, then it's like non-deterministic what happens. Like, you know, if the connection to Redis drops and then reconnects, then you're going to lose messages in the intermeeting time. So it's not going to be consistent. Like all these like little nits that I'm like, Eesh. Um, but then also like you've got a freaking sweet thing working. So you know, who am I to judge? I mean, um, how 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 uh, how hard is it to sort of like plug those holes good enough? for, you know? Yeah, the Redis one is actually much easier than it used to be. It used to be a huge pain in the neck. Um, and I know because I did it for JDB. Um, but now Redis has like a Kafka-esque message queue that you can consume from and subscribe to. It's like publish messages to, and that's that's got like, you know, guaranteed in order delivery and guaranteed, you know, like, yeah. Um, so that's pluggable, that's fine. Um, and the, the sleeping thing here, like I imagine there's another way to do it where you just like, you know, if, if one thing's like, has a generator um, and then you should just be able to like consume from a um, message stream and then just sleep until you get a message and get woken up when that happens. Uh, but I don't know anything about G events or so, yeah. Yeah. Like I know with Actix and with Go, Go has the same thing. Like, you know, it gives you channels. Like if you're doing like actor style, then you get a channel and you just say like, consume from the channel please. And then your like um, green thread or whatever it is just sits there blocked and then as soon as the message comes in, it con continues and it uses zero CPU until then because it's just, just asleep until it happens. But um, yeah. But then, uh, yeah, as you say, like maybe it doesn't matter if this, like, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I'm like, I, I, I know what I'm getting into with concurrency yeah. Python, you know? Um, sort of like make the best of uh, a bad thing because I have to choose between staying in Py with Python or moving on to a language that's very much not Python. <laughs> oh yeah. And totally. I love Python. So I'm oh, <laughs> I was wondering why that, why that decision was difficult, but now I know. <laughs> uh, because it's not the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, I'd be surprised <laughs> if no one's like if, added if to Something. If it turns out that the CRDT is like not working here, then I'll move that part out to the best of my ability. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm totally cool with ripping this out entirely, but at least this will enable me to build like the front end stuff and actually have, I'm going to have some pretty cool chat stuff going on two weeks from now. <laughs> I can tell you that much. Like <laughs> more than just messages, Wait. like the messages will be like indie web style so they'll be like separate they'll be on their own resources and very much like interlinked and and discoverable by search engines and whatnot and then the chat is going to have like its own sort of shared state with like who's idle who's not and who's in the chat who, who's active in the chat whose tabs are open and things like that that i think i can 
exercise some real time uh, grade. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's super sweet. Um, yeah, and and I think yeah, I'm not sure if I'm not sure about YJS, but well, um, Kevin's in the process of writing wires, which is like a Rust implementation. Um, there's also a Rust implementation of uh, auto merge, but um, ideally, what I want to do is get one or both or something else um, into a WASM module, and then we can just pull that in into Python and C and in the browser and everywhere. Because um, WASM works great in Rust, uh, sorry, in Python as well. So then, then it should be fine just to bridge across and call that code from everywhere. So, oh, WASM works in Python. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Could you just? Um, how does it work in Python? This I. Uh, I, I, there's Python, Wasm virtual machines, like libraries that people have. I see. Um, so you great. pull in a library and then you say like, here's the Wasm module and it's like, great. And then it exports out all the methods into Python and bridges. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Wasm is super sweet. I have a great. question for you, Angelo. Um, have you been able to um, run HTTP2 on these uh, individual servers? Or is it running HTTP 1.1? And the, the reason I ask is because it's a sort of like a, a possible thing to be a, a alert to in case you end up with some some um, hard to debug uh, connections not working due to the one HTTP 1.1 limit. Oh, very nice, cool. Is that a, is that indication enough? I mean, I have I have configured nginx for H. Two, G Unicorn. I have to use G Unicorn for my G event stuff. I've moved yeah. away from UWSGI, so I'm in this new server. I have zero. I've not configured it at all, other than to say green it. Use G That's event. cool. Um, but yeah, that, uh, that, that answers the question, I think. Uh, unless there's some trickiness that's happening between HTTP two and then like maybe some proxy HTTP one point one. But I think it sounds like you're running HTTP two straight through. So that's really cool. I'll make sure that I'm running G Unicorn on HTTP2 if I can, which it may be. I'll look into it. Yeah. Is there a way in HTTP2 for the client to close a particular stream? Like if the server just holds open a subscription and it's like an HTTP stream, is, can the client at some point just say like, I'm done with this now without closing the whole TCP connection? No yes. Yeah. Can an, H an HTTP two client can close an individual stream without closing the TCP connection? Okay. Great. That's good to know. Yeah. So I, think, I think either side can. The server can as well. Great. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes sense. The server can because the server can just say like, okay, I'm done sending you stuff here. Um, but yeah, I was sure if the client could. Um, yeah, that's good. Have you guys have you guys needed to ping pong or anything? Yeah, Seth was just looking at adding a heartbeat in order to prevent Firefox from closing TCP connections on you. You might be running into that. And we, yeah. there's a GitHub issue that he added about that. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking for you, Seth. But <laughs> Love it. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, because yeah, we don't have anything in a spec yet, but it'd be good. Yeah, yeah, we need something just like as like a no up, you know, like <laughs> here's a heartbeat message, ignore it, um, you know. Which we could just like put a dot in, or we could have a header that just says "hot colon b new line new line" or something. I don't know. Cool. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on. I'm gonna give a so I'm gonna talk about this Braid JS library now, uh, or maybe it's, I guess it's called Braidify. So okay, let's click on this. Cool. So. In moving towards more use and getting more stuff built and making it easier to build stuff, I'm trying to make a common JavaScript library that handles that braidifies existing JavaScript libraries for HTTP. And so this is a lot like what Angelo just showed with braidifying in Python. And um, so I've gotten to the point, so I spent the, uh, I, I, did, I rewrote all this parsing code just the last couple of days and is now pretty abstracted so that you can add um, a little braidification wrapper for different APIs. And so right now I've got one for fetch and one for nodes HTTP. And this works both for 
node uh, require HTTP as a server and as a client. Um, so, uh, and the fetch also works in the browser. So you can do a, like the browser has a fetch API and then node also has a fetch client um, called node fetch, which is like unofficial or something. And it has some bugs, <laughs> but if you want to use the same fetch API from the browser and node, you can do that. And we can verify either one. And then we can also use nodes HTTP module, both as a server and a client. And we can verify either one of those. Um, I haven't implemented it yet for other things like Axios and SuperAgent, but I'm kind of interested in just verifying anything now in JavaScript. The, and so the general model, I wonder if I could type it in here, would be like, um, uh, well, I guess I'll just show some examples. So, I, so I'd love to, I want to go through the API and how it works and because it's hard to change APIs once people are using them. So I'd like to get some feedback on that in particular so we can find something good. Um, and so I'm going to show, let's see, so I've got examples here for using a braid in a browser fetch, um, Node.js client using fetch, a Node.js client using require HTTP, Node.js server using require express, Node.js server using require HTTP. So these are the examples I have working right now. Um, and, and the idea for this code, by the way, is to make a reference implementation. So I'm not like being creative with how the protocol should work. I just want it to meet whatever's in the spec. And this spec, we're still solidifying it. So I'm just trying to keep it updated with the current state of consensus. Um, Why is, what's and then? Usually for the promise spec, it's just dot then. Yeah, let's get into that. So, um, so in browser fetch, you can fetch something and then you can specify a subscribe. Um, this keep alive true part will have to change as we figure out what's going on with the subscribe header because we just removed this part from it. Um, but then when you get back something, so um, normally fetch returns a promise, which gives you one, one result. And if you want to stream a whole bunch of results, then you, that promise returns a streaming object that you then call then on. And then I think you have to like recursively do it or something. So, and then is what if instead of just a promise that returned one thing, you had a, reprom a promise that returned a, a bunch of things in a row. So um, you could also imagine this, maybe we could rename this like dot subscribe or something. It's just being like, a little bit of a nicer API than the existing promise thing. But I also understand that it's non-standard and there's a little bit of work to, to make this work. I think it's pretty yeah. different than the promise thing because it, I mean, the code under the hoods of that is opening a stream. It's, it's uh, putting an, an abstraction over a stream, I assume, which the promise thing doesn't do. You can't, there's no, it seemed like what you were saying is that this uh, and then is just a, a small like wrapper over something that you could do with a recursive function. But I, um, is that true? But, um, this is a wrapper over something that you could do. With a recursive um, function? I, I don't think it's necessarily a recursive function. It's like, it's kind of a funny, I don't know exactly how to, how to state what it, what it is. I'm pretty sure it's you a don't stream. want a recursive function. I, I, I've written this code in before we had promises in JavaScript, and it was awful because you had to like, you, like in the callback, you'd be like, "Great, now I want the next one," and then that would like recursively call the next you know, a couple levels up in the in the callback loop, and then handle errors correctly. And yeah. the the control flow, like you can look find bits in ShareJS, right? When I wrote this in Node 0.4, and it's the control flow is really difficult to read. Like I figured out how to do it, and it works, but it's hard. Like for my money, what, like, I wouldn't do this in promises because the current promise spec works with async await. So like the async, so the await keyword specifically is going to call an then function, not the and then. So this is like forcing you back into callback world um, where you're passing a callback to a, a function. Um, um, yeah, we yeah. You also want a for a wait version of it. Great. Yeah, that, that's my preference. Because um, then you can just use regular control flow um, and just throw that in a loop. 
Yeah. So, so the, um, so here, here's some, so the, the design and so, the, you know, this is probably the biggest design decision is how do you get back multiple things? One way you can do this with a callback and the earlier version of this code used a callback, um, but fetch doesn't take a callback. It only does promises. So I tried to make a version that was similar to promise code for people who are used to, who are still using promises, but then also um, have a four a weight and I haven't finished the four a weight version, but that's, I think it's going to be possible to do something like this for a weight var a new version of fetch a thing, which you can't even do right now. Like this won't run because the return value from fetch is not an async iterable. But I think we can make the return value from fetch be an async iterable that you can also use a regular then and you can also do an and then. So I'm trying to make something that's multi compatible. Um, but I appreciate all these discussions. So that's just like the high level. So I'm really curious about like overall, uh, 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 yeah, feedback on this API again. <laughs> I have, I have a, a, a sort of small feedback the, I, um, the, the name and then, um, I guess my feedback is just that that's a little bit, uh, it's not, it's, it feels to me the same as then. Um, like if somebody were to introduce the promise API originally, it wouldn't surprise me if they named it and then. It would because it'd be longer than just saying then. But semantically, you're saying here's a promise, uh, and when it's done, you know, and then. <laughs> um, I th I think the the semantic that you want to somehow convey there is that it will be called multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, I think and then was like a cheeky concept that maybe was just as I'm thinking about how to explain, it's like then, but it keeps repeating. And um, I can acknowledge that it's not <laughs> very clear. Uh, I know where you're going with it. Like it's like <laughs> then and then and then and then. But uh, yeah, do we have any other ideas for what to call that here? I can just keep brainstorming things too. Subscribe my favorite. Subscribe. Um, yeah. Or on version, like a, the, the, the semantic. Of, oh yeah. The way that callback because yeah. what this is is it's a callback function and it's semantically the same as like a stream where you have an on data and an on close so it could be called on version okay um yeah yeah i was gonna does say fetch, as a bit of does feedback. fetch emit uh events already? no but he's making it okay. do that yeah right right um and is uh, as it is an async iterable um, that that would serve both purposes, right? It would allow you to for a wait on it, but it would also allow you to dot then get a promise on a fetch. Yeah, yeah. The, an async iterable object has an extra property that's like a hidden property. Okay. To let you do that, um, it's like that's a the symbol. Symbol mm -hmm. thing, yeah. So you can make it also be whatever else you want it to be. Oh, interesting. Um, so that, that yeah. would be backwards compatible with fetch. It would just be strange probably for people to see a four-way wait on a fetch, but it would hint at what it's doing. So could, yeah. could yeah, Yeah, there's also a couple other interesting design decisions here. So one of them is, um, oh yeah, and like just to reiterate what Greg was saying, like um, I hear you're trying to make something that feels like promises. The, to me at least, the whole deal with promises is that I can await them, right? That's how they're different from callbacks. So if I need to use callbacks for this, then it's just callbacks API. It's not promises API um, because it's just a callback. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, well, I think um, I think these days, now that we have async a wait, I think when people when programmers enter with that model, there is also yeah. a model from the past where people are just using promises, and the advantage of a promise is that you don't have nested callbacks. And so I think it, there, there's probably some value to being to fitting in smoothly with that style of programming. But but the, the reason why we didn't have nested callbacks is because promises yielded a single value. So I could return a value from the, the then method on a promise. And then I could chain it underneath by then having another promise. Like I could then treat, uh, like if I had a promise that returned a value, then I could have a, a then function that would return another value or a promise. And then, then I could then that, I could then at the higher level. So I wouldn't have, like I wouldn't go deeper. But this doesn't give me that property because obviously the, like presumably there's nothing, there's nothing semantic around what the and then method returns. Well, you can um, add a catch to it. And so this is, 
for instance, this is how you can implement reconnections. You can you can catch errors in that. Yeah. And you probably aren't going to add a dot then after the end then because nothing else is going to happen. Right, right. But my point is just that like if I said is this more similar to promises or callbacks, the answer is it's much more similar to callbacks um, than it is promises, which is fine. It's like I yeah I. I in my opinion, the right answer is the 408 thing, which it looks like you want to do anyway. But um, yeah, that's my aesthetic sense. OK. Yeah, I mean, we could um, also have a callback. Um, I'm not sure where it would have to go in as a parameter to fetch. And I had a version of this where the third parameter would be a callback. But then you also need like a fourth parameter maybe for the error callback. Or I guess you could merge those into the same one or something. Yeah, and what Greg was saying I agree with, which is that like the classic way this is done is by uh, by event emitters. So like you'd say fetch, and then after that you get back an object, and then you'd say my fetch object dot on message equals or dot on patch equals, and then you have a, a method. Um, and then that's how you like register which whichever events you want to, and then you don't have to pass all the events in the, in the constructor. You can instead just register them after the after you've created the, the fetch itself. Yeah, I think that's one of the ways is that um, is there is that preferable to passing in a callback? As a parameter, um, usually if if there's like one obvious thing that happens next, then callback is the default. But if there's like multiple different optional things, then then assigning uh, events after the fact is the norm. Is the norm. I see. Um, so you don't have to have different ar so many different arguments. You can just yeah. give them names in the on handler. Okay. Yeah, but that's all. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to go down that road, uh, the other thing that's interesting here is that um, so fetch right now you call fetch you get back a promise the promise then contains the body which is another promise so i can then say get me the body and then i await that and then i get back the body mm -hmm. so like the deal is that i call fetch i await that and that returns when i've got the headers back so when i know the status code and headers and then there's another step which is like now i want to wait for the, the actual content itself um so i'm like curious with the api you're proposing here um is there like, is there a distinction there? Like, can I, you know, do I do I know when I've like when I when I'm subscribed? Is that a separate? Is I'm subscribed separate from, um, I've got a patch. Interesting, right? So this, um, there is not that distinction here. Although, you know, you might be able to do a fetch and then a dot then to give you back the initial response, to tell you when the initial response happens. Mm -hmm. And then you might be able to dot and then that one. I mean, that, that should be at least possible to implement. I don't know if it works right now, it might. <laughs> um, but that might be able to give you that, inf that, that seems like an important thing to do in going with the spirit of being backwards compatible and low level so that you can get the initial set of headers um, and also get this higher level access to the new versions yeah i agree yeah yeah it did <laughs> I, I agree with that too it does um doesn't seem hard to implement and it gives you it lets you know that you're connected even if there's nothing there yeah yeah you want to know when you're connected and <laughs> you want to know what the headers are and you want to know if you're not connected you know um I wonder if there's also a place for um, calling fetch dot then, and then inside the then, um, being able to access a stream on the returned object. I mean, that's how fetch works. That's the that's the normal <laughs> way that fetch works. Yeah. Yeah. So then, did that make sense, Mike? So there would be no and then in that case. You would always call fetch. You'd call fetch dot then. And the oh, I think thing inside of then would give you something to stream. Okay, so um, we could add an um, like, a, so that's how this is implemented. It's using that API, but it could be nice to have a slightly higher level, like a helper, to help you handle that stream. Yeah. You can, yeah. Um, yeah, and to use the num, num the like the right words. Fetch yields fetch returns a promise, which yields the um, the response object. The response object then has some different methods on it, like dot body, dot text, you know, some like helpers, like dot JSON. I think for the JSON version of the body, 
Um, and, and also get you can use that. Yeah, get reader. So you can get the stream out of it. So I could imagine an API like this where we still get the response back. And then on the response, we say dot get patches or something. And that returns an async iterable of all the patches. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, let me add. Could we, we have a, I think we, we have a, a get patches oh, function um, yeah. on the server. Um, and so that's, that sounds really, really like an, a, a much, a big improvement to add that to the client too. Great. Oh, and sorry, it shouldn't be get patches. It should be get updates if we're going by the words that we were using in that GitHub issue. Um, okay. Yeah. Get, um, I'm going to call it get versions or get yeah. updates because I know that we don't have okay. a group there. So that's what both Yeah. Because we don't have consensus yet. But yeah. Yeah. Because they might not be patches. Um, but yeah. Yeah, patches is, is most most likely not going to be patches. <laughs> I think patches uh, yeah. are lower level. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, this is really helpful. Any anything else on this this fetch stuff? Uh, right now, you're importing the script http client uh, js, and then I assume that's monkey patching the native. Uh, fetch. Yeah, there is also a uh, version using ES6 imports. I think it's working. Yeah. Um, I didn't test it before this meeting. <laughs> yeah. I think I yeah, think Dwayne's using it. Yeah, I would imagine uh, the yes, imports option would be a uh, better way, or uh, you exporting a um, uh, you know braid fetch or whatever it is uh, as a global rather than necessarily monkey monkey patching fetch. Uh, cause monkey patching, it was common in like the jQuery, uh, well, even before, no, the prototype days. And then after prototype, then jQuery and whatnot, they started just exposing global variables where there was less conflicts and errors. And also it makes it explicitly clear, uh, to the, uh, user that this is something that's been imported rather than something that's built in and also makes things like typing with TypeScript, uh, easier because monkey patching in TypeScript is just a pain in the ass. Yeah, I understand. The, um, and we, we definitely want to support all those different programming models. And um, one thing that I haven't said about this uh, is at, since we are also taking on the standards process, it's, I think it's open to us to make a proposal to Wetwig as well, which is the group that defines fetch and say, you know, there, there could be a new API for fetch. And if you want to have a new API for fetch, here's a little polyfill library that you can include in your app uh, to play with it and see how it works. But maybe this could be a browser standard in fetch itself, in which case, um, you know, monkey patching could be the way to implement that polyfill. I think for, for most pro, uh, JavaScript code, we do want to have isolated modules. One, uh, one possible architectural um, uh, sort of tweak that might help here, Mike, is to, um, to create the, um, to separate the monkey patching from the, um, from the braid core implementation that you're doing. Uh, so then you could say, here are the, here are the, like, here's braid put and braid fetch and whatever, like you were doing before. Um, and if you, want them directly, great, you can export those. Or here's our, here's our polyfilled fetch that we added those methods to fetch for you. You know, that, that would be kind of a nice separation. Um, yeah, right now I'm, I'm thinking that the, if you, maybe if you do the script tag way, which inherently modifies a global variable, then um, it's gonna do something in globals. And that could be changing fetch it's directly, or it could be adding some other variable that you're using. Like it could be fetch dot braid or something. Like we could just add a, a field to it, and then you could replace fetch if you want to by saying fetch equals fetch dot braid. Um, or if you do the import way, then it would probably just import it concisely. Sorry, uh, that that's. <laughs> um, I really disagree with that as a design choice. Um, like. Yeah, I think if you're importing a script tag, there's like a bunch of semantics around how script tags import that matter more based on 
your style and your hacking system and everything else. And I don't think that should impact the API you get back. Uh, what do you disagree with there? Um, so I think what I heard Dwayne propose was that um, it sounds like there's kind of two different APIs that different programmers want to consume. And one of them is like, uh, you know, a direct method that's like, you know, braid subscribe method and you pass in the URL and you get back a stream. And then another API is the fetch API. Uh, like we, instead of returning an actual method, we polyfill fetch so that you can use fetch to do that. Um, that's what I heard uh, Dwayne say. And then it sounded like you were saying like, well, you can pick based on whether or not you're importing the code as a script tag. Um, I might propose instead you pick by which JavaScript file you import. So maybe there's two JavaScript files and one of them gives you the direct API with a method that you can call and it gives you back a braid subscription. And there's another file that if you import that, it polyfills um, fetch. Okay, so I, API. okay, so I think what you're, what you're saying is that you don't wanna have, um, a single job you disagree with having a single JavaScript file that forces you to modify fetch. You'd rather that being and not like some other some script that you like. Uh, you'd, you'd rather there be a script file that you can use import with a script tag that does not modify the existing fetch. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, let me add that to the feedback. I think I've seen some libraries do that with a like. Um, require braidify slash polyfill or something like that or, or yeah. script tag you know braidify slash polyfill and then you kind of yeah on the consuming side you know what you're getting yeah yeah I, i've added like attributes to the script tag that it'll read you know you know see some some way to, mo to modify this yeah i just think having a couple different files and you can just import which one you want yeah. Easy. The other issue with polyfills is uh, version in case the API changes, uh, it then becomes impossible uh, to manage differences in versions where using uh, a module based solution, then the dependent clients uh, can make sure they're using the correct version that they're actually compatible with of the API mm -hmm. client. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks for that feedback. So I'm gonna incorporate all that. Um, we've also got, uh, okay, so this is very similar, but this is using um, the node fetch. So you can refire, gratify, and then say dot fetch, and that'll give you a fetch object. Um, I think this uses node fetch under the hood, and you can use similar code as before to run that. Um, here's what it looks like with require HTTP as a client. So you can require braidjs.http, and in this API, you can call that, use that to um, on the HTTP, require HTTP or require HTTPS object, and it will modify it into a braid version. Or if you say .get, you can say subscribe true, and this is um, then the response, it adds a version event which is a lot like what we were talking about earlier. So normally you can say res.on data or dot on um, end or error. Here's an example of res.on end and, and error down here. So this adds a version event that will give you new versions as they come in. Yeah, I like the, uh, the require then the NPM package then dot whatever it is and you pass over what you're using. Uh, also, in cases of typing, like with TypeScript, you can make sure then, uh, at, you know, when you're writing the code that whatever you're passing is meeting the uh, class abstraction or the object abstraction that is actually what uh, BraidJS is expecting. Um, and then you can get back. It works a lot better with uh, typing in general and can provide those consistencies. And then you can also have, you know, dot fetch rather than dot HTTP and then you pass over whichever fetch library it is, even if it's just a global fetch. Uh, and then it can also check um, that whatever it is, is compatible. So you get those uh, typing uh, guarantees, whereas the alternative uh, solutions um, become a bit more difficult to manage. You can also with uh, NPM package dependencies with the peer dependencies flag, uh, uh, although you probably actually don't want to use that at all because the latest NPM, again, it installs all the peer dependencies, uh, which isn't what you uh, 
uh, one if the library is optional. So uh, yeah, so for this case, it would be, uh, it would probably be the ideal. Otherwise, the only other option that I can suggest is where each uh, uh, layer or compatibility layer is then its own uh, package. Um, and then you can say the peer dependencies thing without installing every single compatibility dependency. Uh, yeah, so. Cool, yeah, so you like um, explicit function calls for wrapping things because then you get type information, I think, and all the dependencies are clear, great. This is a super small thing if you're just looking for feedback for like the API use in the future. I, I'm just gonna bring attention to it. I don't even know what the right answer is, but you, you have here require braidjs.http and then require HTTPS. There's kind of a thing in node with HTTP versus HTTPS. They're the same library basically, but they, um, in any case, um, it might be confusing to people <laughs> that it says, like you might, you might wanna have two different functions, one called HTTP and one called HTTPS um, to make it clear that like you're, um, I think it's the case that the way that you're wrapping it uh, doesn't even matter which one it is. Yeah, it just doesn't care. Um, so I, I think it might make sense to give it a name that isn't either HTTP or HTTPS, but it's a different name like server, uh, assuming that they're both servers, the server version of both of those. Okay. Wrap, maybe. Wrap, yeah. wrap or server doesn't really <clears throat> hint at the actual library that's yeah no and and i and i agree that that's a, a con and that's why i say that i'm not sure what the right answer is i'm not sure that it's yeah. it might be perfect as it is i just wanted to call attention to it okay. yeah well you can just do like an alias where uh http the https export is exactly the same as the http export that's what seems um, best to me just they're both the same function yeah, because with Node developers, uh, they'll know the kind of what that is referencing and the typing information like the JS stuff will kind of make that uh, clear as well. Um, and you also have like a plethora of people's pet favorite uh, libraries, be it fetch libraries or HTTP based uh, libraries as well. Um, so it, it, it kind of at least for me, one of the interesting questions uh, for the overall idea of this is uh, one of the things that was appealing for the, at least a basic braid spec was, you know, how uh, easy it can actually be just to, you know, add a little bit more headers and whatnot. Um, but then I've yet to actually experiment with implementing it, but theoretically it seems really easy. Uh, so I wonder, uh, for the difficulty of this, like, are we saving the implementer like hours or are we saving them days? Or are we saving them minutes by utilizing this kind of braidify idea? Depends on the application. The most complex part of the code is parsing HTTP text into JavaScript objects for each version. And um, if you're not bothering implementing, uh, receiving a subscription, then it's not a big deal. You know, if, if you're using Braid just to like put a new version, then it's pretty easy. And also if you know that your application has a very constrained use of subscriptions, then it's also easier to parse. You know, so I think like um, uh, Angelo, I think implemented a parser that works for his chat, but it might not work for general subscriptions. And, you know. and then there's also a yeah, couple of cases with like some gotchas, like you wanna make sure you configure the, the node server to keep the connection alive, not kill it after a timeout and stuff like that. Yeah, I would, <clears throat> I'd say the hardest part is kind of related to parsing, but it's that you're getting these datums <clears throat> that you don't, you might, you might get a datum that has part of the first uh, version. And then you might get a datum after that that has both the second part of the first version and also the beginning of the second version. And <clears throat> you need to consume that <laughs> somehow. You need to, you know, as you get that second packet, you need to know that you now have completed the first version and that you still have some extra that will you, you'll keep around to, um, when you get the second version. Like you basically have to um, deal with the fact that it's a stream 
Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. in addition, yeah, like you're before you're parsing it. Yeah. It's a stream of bytes being turned into a stream of messages. So you need to right. do message framing. Um, right. It ended up being like, to answer your question, how much effort saved. Um, I think it's like about 100 lines or so of code um, in my braid, uh, braid protocol implementation that um, that handles subscriptions and does all of that uh, little like state machine based puzzle kind of thing. Um, it's not too bad, but it's also the kind of code that would take me hours to write, but probably take a lot of people like days or weeks to write. Uh, okay, so I want to get a little feedback on these last two as well before we can and then move on or just at least show them. Uh, I, so um, we've got like probably a half hour left. So um, this is all, so we've looked at a bunch of client things. Um, unless there's any other feedback, by the way, if anyone has anything outstanding on this style of API, it's, it's just a little bit different than the fetch, but pretty similar. Yeah, I, I, and just to name it, my, my preference is to not use things like this. And I said, use like clear direct braid specific APIs, but as long as we've got that choice, then um, that'll stay my preference, I think. Things like what? Um, like my preference is not to write polyfills and use them. Like if I'm a consumer of Braid, uh, my preference as an application developer would be like, I want a library that just does Braid. And then, you know, and then I don't have to worry about things like two different versions of Braidify being NPM installed and then one of them polyfilling HTTP one way and another one polyfilling it slightly differently and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would second that. I, if I were to consume uh, Braid as a developer, I would want an API that wasn't integrated into the underlying node libraries. I would want something that was explicitly off to the side that I could integrate myself just as my own personal preference for doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Okay, so you don't want anything that you, you just wanted this a totally separate API that doesn't have anything to do it doesn't try to emulate the existing APIs. Doesn't try to overwrite them like I would want to I would want to be calling, I'd want to know, I, to me it's, uh, I'm gonna give the name magic anytime there's code sort of inserted into the existing stuff so that if I just called a, a function that I thought was a node function or part of the node standard library, if it does anything different, I would call that magic. And I, I tend to not want any magic. I want everything that I do to be explicit. I'm calling a function to tell it that it's doing some node okay. thing. Okay, so maybe I, mean, some thing. I see. So in this case, um, instead of wrapping HTTP, you'd rather just require HTTP and then have some helpers that you can call um, yeah. that would like call it on the resource, for instance, that gives you back a bunch of versions, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. One, one uh, idea where I think something like this would be useful is the case of Cloudflare workers, which just uses the web worker API. And then they do a little bit more fancy stuff on their request and uh, that they provide to the consumer. So having something uh, there that's very minimal that can be imported using ES modules would uh, kind of be quite nice. Obviously with Cloudflare workers, they don't have built-in support for ES modules. You have to kind of use a pre-compiler to uh, concatenate everything into one file. Uh, but that would be one instance where I think something like this could kind of be nice where I can just have a, a API where I just say this is the version and then I just send it to the uh, Cloudflare worker res uh, object or whatever it is. Um, not particularly that articulate for what, what I'm kind of requesting here because it's just coming off the fly now, but that would be one use case where you got these kind of very low level things interacting directory with uh, HTTP uh, or, or like these built-in little low-level libraries where they're just wanting something super basic. Um, however, I think uh, the the uh, the particular uh, issue here is regarding polyfills. Um, I don't think anyone has expressed support for that idea uh, compared to just uh, importing a uh, direct library that does what it needs to. Um, however, uh, whatever that library is, it will need to kind of take into account um, certain, you know, these different things. So it could be a instance where, because um, architecturally the concern is going to be, should the, as you know, the Braid.js client developer uh, 
it would be nice maybe for them to be able to hook in these little low level things that's compatible with a bunch of uh, environments um, per se and then then can talk with those uh, compatibility layers with this high level client that then is kind of used by people um, but yeah as an application developer you're probably going to want maybe something high i don't know i haven't <laughs> they, we probably need a larger sample size of people trying to implement braid before we can try and figure out how to uh well it's fine we, their efforts. we can do both versions and then people can use whatever they prefer and that's fine yeah. it's not it doesn't okay. take a lot of work yeah um the the idea here is um in the like in the braid spirit of extending existing http that we could also be extending existing http libraries because that that there is some philosophically that connect that distinction or that question comes back to like well why are we trying to put this on http entirely when you could just open a tcp connection with a totally different way of doing subscriptions and and updates and that's what programmers web programmers have been doing for the last decade or so and um so philosophically um you know it's like we're trying to show that in the existing web programming model that this there is an a, an architectural extension at least that's that's what i'm trying to do with this with this library but it's not important i think it's um we, we can let the, the market bear that out and just provide a few options and i think that'll actually make the code easier to implement too so i'm going to go for that yeah i i really like the idea of um having something to propose to uh what working group at some point um around changing the existing http libraries uh like the existing uh, you know like the existing like adding this stuff into the browser natively um like I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I, I'm just like hesitant to use it until, until that point, or until like we've got a spec or something. Um, but yeah. Um, but I like the, I like the idea of eventually having something that's part of the browser. Um, be that like something changed in fetch, or like maybe instead of fetch, we just want a new top level global method called subscribe. It's like fetch, but it subscribes, um, or something. I don't know. But yeah, I think it'd be sweet. Yeah, I, I agree. And I just wanted to say my, my preference for having explicit libraries as opposed to polyfills is my own preference for consuming a library. But I, there are two, two things that I think are important on the, um, if you want to put this into the spec eventually, I think it makes sense to create a polyfill for the purpose of showing people what it would be like. I think that's a valid, like even though Greg wouldn't use it for his actual work. Uh, I think it's useful for that. And also I think that some people do like magical libraries or polyphones. Yeah. <laughs> Angela and Mike, presumably. <laughs> Among others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I, great. I think this is really interesting, uh, but I do want to keep us moving. Yeah. Um, Maybe we could, I'd love to also get your feedback on the server. We've only been looking at client code, um, but I'll tr try to go through this quickly. Um, I'll just point out some things. So here you say, like, for instance, if you have a an express app, you can say app.usebraidify. That's very similar to Angelo's um, web dot something, <laughs> web dot wrap braidify. And so there's an interesting analog there in Python world. And that will add a few methods in Express to your request object. You can see if there's a subscription. If so, you can tell the server whether to actually um, start a subscription because you can also tell the client, no, I'm not going to let you subscribe. If you do subscribe, you can pass it on close. Or you can get an on close event. Um, this automatically sets a status code to 209 for you and then tells the server not to uh, kill the connection and it keeps it open. And then on your response, you can tell it to send versions. And this is how you send back a stream of versions and it will format them um, using the braid way. None of this code, all of this code right now um, only uses the range patch spec. There's an open to do to make it support arbitrary patch formats and patch types. I'm not sure what the API for that should be yet. Um, and that's a basic way to do this on a server right now. There's also, you can also do it without Express, just with raw HTTP um, by uh, calling Braidify on the rec and res. It's, that's basically all it does anyway. Any thoughts on this before we move on? I 
five, four, three, two. Okay, Greg, you're up. All right. Well, that thing at the end is a good uh, a good transition to to me. All right, I'm going to share. <clears throat> I'm sharing just a single window this time. I've never tried this before. Can you guys see? Yes. Uh, stuff. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this stuff here is <clears throat> is like at some point I presented something about auto merge. I had been tasked with trying to get auto merge to uh, um, talk over braid, and there was this <clears throat> way of trying to take auto merge stuff and shove it into braid. Um, then I did something. I don't think I presented it to the group, but I did the same thing with YJS and. Um, it was in a sense harder to translate uh, between YJS and Braid. And so this way that I came up with is, uh, is much more generic. It, um, like this is the wrapper. And this, this way of wrapping something can wrap anything. <laughs> uh, there's two, um, you know, there's sending messages and receiving messages. And basically sending messages, um, it, this wrapper is going to generate uh, its own Braid ID and then it, the wrapper has some local state that keeps track of um, leaf versions. And it's going to um, make the leaf version that there is currently, if we're sending something out, it's going to make the leaf version be um, just this current version that, you know, that's, that's our, our new leaf version. And the parents of it will be whatever our previous leaf versions were. Uh, and then it sends it out. And to receive it, um, it just says that the, it adds whatever version this is that's incoming to our leaf versions. Um, and it also removes any parents that this thing has from our leaf versions. Um, and then it just applies uh, stuff stored in this, um, Extra extra variable on the side, this user defined stuff. So also when it's sending it, it sends the user defined information. And so um, armed with that technology, <laughs> but going back to auto merge, here is a demo of auto merge using that wrapper, using the the YJS wrapper, which is a very generic wrapper. Um, and here we have two. Uh, two clients, these are both in the same web page, but they're talking to an actual web server. And you can see they have the same text in them. And these uh, things that you see here are the, uh, is the HTTP stuff that's sent over the wire. The green stuff is the stuff that's incoming from the perspective of this client. And the black stuff is the stuff that's outgoing from the perspective of this client. Um, anyway, and you can see in here that, so the, the first, message that we're receiving is from the server and it's just telling us about the initial state of the environment. This is auto merge, so it's JSON. So we just need to create a thing that has some text that has created uh, a key with text and it has some text. Um, what's, uh, what's auto data? Auto data is the auto merge native data. So auto merge, this is using auto merge, um, the performance branch, Mike has a yeah, maybe um, so some context here is that this is demonstrating two auto merge clients that are synchronizing together where they're um, whenever every message they send is sent in two different formats simultaneously. It's sent in the auto merge native format, which is encoded um, in an array of numbers there. That's just binary data, a binary data encoding for auto merge data. And it's also sent using the braid range patch. Um, they both, in this demo, they're both only reading that auto merge binary data. So they're not reading the braid data. And um, figuring out how to read the braid data is something that we're like looking into next, I think. Right. Yeah, that's our next step. And as Mike says, this is not um, the, neither of these clients is consuming the braid data, but the braid data is there. And presumably a third client that didn't speak auto merge could um, could see a rough equivalent of this text. They wouldn't see it exactly because they wouldn't have known how to merge it exactly because that information is not contained in the braid information. Um, 
but uh, they could merge it somewhat. <laughs> um, anyway, you can see the you can see the the patches that it's creating here, um, and this is all just hopefully <laughs> following the spec. And this is actually using uh, some code that Mike wrote. These libraries that he was talking about uh, are being used by me over here. Um, here you can see this braid fetch thing. Uh, I guess this is an earlier version of, of Mike's thing where it's called braid fetch explicitly, which I don't mind, of course. Um, and then on the server, so this is the server, this is the code for the server. Um, it's all it's using the, the braidify thing. So th this is the API at the very end of Mike's presentation, there was a thing for uh, dealing with <laughs> um, a regular HTTP server uh, on the server, not an express server. And this is the way, like the way a, a regular HTTP server is you get a request object and a response object. And these are handed to Braidify and it will look to see if it's a, a subscription and um, adjust some headers and things. Um, anyway, uh, I, that's basically, that's, that's basically it. There's something I wanted to, um, uh, point out or recommend, or I don't know what the, um, here's a thought for the group. Um, so in this little demo here, uh, a, a third party that was listening to this wouldn't know how to merge correctly. And thus far, I think that the, the thought for how uh, people can know how to merge correctly is there will be a merge type and people will have to read the merge type and not to support that merge type. Um, here's, a, here's another thought that's in the, in the spirit of this sort of sending both bits of information simultaneously. Um, what if instead of, so currently the, when we create a new version and we have some parents that currently these patches, uh, in this case, they're done with respect to the root, but um, some of these you'll see it has two parents. So this is done with respect to both of these versions. And really what it's done, like these patches are done with respect to the implicit merger of these versions, but they don't have to be. These patches could be done with respect to one or the other of these versions. And that would make it bigger because it would have to duplicate the information in the other version. But in principle, it would in general be only twice as big and you'd get, you'd know what the merger was. And so anybody could merge correctly. Anybody could receive the information. You'd get the benefit of it being, of getting deltas uh, and the benefit of even dumb clients being able to have the correct information in the end. Anyway. Are, are you suggesting, so to so understand this, but are you suggesting that it would, as a client, you would receive two updates for every update, one onto both of the parents? No, I'm suggesting that an arbitrary decision would be made on the part of the person sending the version to present the patches with respect to one or the other of the parent versions, but they would say what both of the parent versions were, but the, the patch itself would be a diff on one or the other of those versions rather than the, the, rather than the implicit merger of the versions. So, I mean, the primary case is that when you've got two concurrent changes, so before there's a third change that depends on the merger of those two. So mm -hmm. like I make a change and you make a change, Greg, now we've got two versions that all peers have to implicitly merge together. At that point, that's the point where you want to know what the result is. Um, it sounds like you're suggesting that well, we make a change so that in a subsequent patch that we can reverse engineer and figure out like, yeah. Okay, that is a good point. This, what I'm suggesting would allow you to know correctly what the current state was whenever you received a version. But whenever you, well, whenever you received yeah, it would, it would let you know what each particular version is, which the current thing doesn't, like you, you get lost at some point you, where you, you receive even a single version that 
collapses everything down to a single version, but you won't know what the content of that version is unless you correctly merged everything above it. This strategy would allow you to, uh, so currently you start out and you drift away from uh, the group and you're helplessly drifted away forever. Uh, this would allow you to kind of pop back and forth. Anytime there were two versions that were leaves, you'd be wrong. But anytime there was one version as a leaf, you'd be correct as a dumb client. I'm still trying to, so, okay, maybe I have, a, I, I think I might understand what you're trying to propose here now. Let me try to restate it. Okay. Um, so I think the situation is that you have some peers that can merge and some peers that don't know how to merge, like they don't have the merge type. And those peers that can merge are the only ones that are sending edits in this scenario. Is that true? Uh, yes, as I was thinking, although I, as I think about it, I'm not sure that they're the only ones who could send edits, I think. Um, okay, well, well, if they- We'll say for now, Okay. I, I haven't thought about that <laughs> side. Okay, so maybe it's simpler. If we think of it as the only peers that have the implement the merge type that know how to merge are the ones sending edits, yeah. then what if in every edit they send, they also provide some information for, hey, anyone out there listening who doesn't know how to merge, if you have this version, here's how you can apply all of the other merges to it also to get to the up-to-date merge. So they kind of explicitly express the merge along with the version. And they don't know, it's a concurrent change. Like they don't know about the other changes yet, right? I know, so um, if, so Seth, if you're in the situation where there, let's say there was a original version called root and then I made an mm -hmm. edit called Greg and then you made an edit called Seth and then Dwayne received both of these versions. Yeah, so um, we've got an original version called root. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. And yeah. then we've got two changes yeah. and we've got, so this is called Greg. Yeah. And this is called Seth. Exactly. Yeah. So here's my, here's my claim. When Dwayne receives both Seth and Greg, Dwayne won't know how to merge them. Dwayne is a mm -hmm. dumb client. However, so at that point, in that, at, at that moment, Dwayne will be in a, Dwayne no, won't know what's up. But let's say that then I make an edit and I, after I've received your edit, so I make a, a third, I make a second edit for myself. I'll but, down here. Um, yeah, that edit I'm going to make on the implicit merger of Seth and Greg. Mm -hmm. But when I send it, if I send it with information that allows you to reconstruct it from either Seth or Greg, so if I'm reconstructing it from Seth, the diff will actually include the information from Greg. Mm -hmm. Then when Dwayne receives it, he can know what the actual text is of that version, the, the bottom version, the one that is. Yeah, so he can, he can then reverse engineer it this point here. He so, could if he wanted to, um, but he wouldn't need to if he's just trying to keep track of the oh, yeah. most recent version. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So notably, this wouldn't work. So at this point here, right? Like you and I have each made concurrent changes. So we don't know that there was actually another change. Yeah. So obviously at this point, I couldn't send I couldn't send along with my change also information about how my change merges with your change. Right. You wouldn't have to. I don't know point. about your change yet. Right, when yeah. you're sending your change originally, you don't have to send information about yeah. other people. So and also notably, the author of this change here, to be able to do that, they need to understand what the merge type is. So yeah. This is like, to Mike's point, that when you create a change, only writers are gonna like, so So this wouldn't work for anyone who's, uh, anyone who wants to write changes because my they're gonna sometimes need to. My disagreement with that is that it would sometimes work for people who wanna write changes. If Dwayne- <laughs> Okay. At the at the okay. bottom point there, where Dwayne has was just this one leaf version, uh -huh. then Dwayne yep. could total, totally make a change. Uh, make yeah, so from here, here they could right. So I can type characters, but sometimes it's not going to work at all. Right. I claim that that's not that's as good as not being able to type characters at all. Like that's that's a bad situation. I'm not going to argue against that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't know. Like my take on this is that. I, I know. know. I mean, weird, this goes back uh, to like. I'm. I know it's a weird thought. I'm. I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
I'm not going to defend it super hard myself, but it was a thought just because the, the yeah, kind of, no, it's, it's an interesting, well, the, the higher level thought is this, like this whole thing that I was working on, uh, Mike wanted kind of has the goal of trying to get different synchronizers, uh, to be able to talk to each other. And, and that's why this thought came to mind is, um, something that does seem useful to me that, uh, that this triggers in me, Greg, I, like, I think this is a very interesting approach because it is increasing compatibility and interoperability. It makes it easier for someone to subscribe and stay up to date with some network. If, you know, even if all you want to do is read or if you do want to write sometimes, it gives you some ability to do that. And that seems like a nice thing. Um, some, a, a version of this that seems even simpler to me that might be beneficial is that Whenever you are sending a write that is like it merges a couple things together, you could send out without not only the patch onto the merger of those parents, but the entire version, like a snapshot of it. And so like, like you could imagine just whenever you're, you're sending data, the, the subscriber could say, I wanna get not just patches, but I wanna get these full snapshots. Or it could even just ask for the, just the, the full snapshots. And that way you can always stay up to date if you want. And so if I'm like writing one of these really cheap clients, you know, like I wrote my own, like if I wrote, if I wrote the 50 lines of code just to subscribe to some data and I wrote it by hand, it might be nice for me to be able to see the full update, um, even though this is like some auto merge thing behind the scenes. Um, so this reminds me of something that I've talked about a bunch of times, but I haven't actually written a proposal in the spec for, um, which is the idea of, so we've got like kind of content types for patches and mergers, but also like we could have another header which is accepts content type or something like it saying here's the or like accepts merge type here's the merge types that i understand and then or like here's the update types the patch types i understand and then when a client connects so if two clients connect one of them understands auto merge changes and it gets the it gets the proper you know patches and everything else and it knows how to merge another client connects and it could say hey i don't actually understand what auto merge changes are like i don't I understand even patches, the server can then respond and say, great, no problem. We're just going to send you a copy of the document with each patch. So, so inside the stream for the second client, it just gets a new copy of the document. And so then this client, which is kind of dumb, it, well, it can subscribe just fine. It's just going to be like network inefficient because it's getting a whole copy of the document every time. Um, I think that would probably work fine. I, I agree. I like that even there's, um, I was going to say I like that even better, and I, I do, although it's different trade-offs, I guess it's more network time, but easier implementation. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think Seth's I, I have, referring to a generalization that could support what you proposed, Greg, or possibly support. I'm not sure, actually, if, the, if you're saying accept merge type or accept patch type. If you could ex express also, I want to accept like multi-patches that to tell you how to rebase previous edits onto all sorts of other branches. I mean, ultimately, we could support everything <laughs> but i i think i understand the uh um what you guys have said in, in this range of possibilities and it seems thanks thanks for entertaining this thought and providing sure. um, <laughs> other thoughts yeah uh, uh I'm, i'll stop if there i'm gonna stop sharing unless there are unless anybody has like uh, questions about this but this this stuff you see here should be pretty recognizable as the um, as the spec stuff. These are regular headers and, what, and whatnot. I've got a couple other questions. Um, is the, so you're generating random versions with each patch. Um, yeah. Could you use instead the like client ID sequence number pair instead of making a random ID? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I just didn't bother because um, it, uh, but it, but it could, yeah. And when I try to make it actually um, like what Mike is interested in ultimately here, which would be very cool, is if we could send, we, if we could get rid of this auto data field entirely, but just in principle, can we reconstruct everything? And we would need to, at least, at the very least, we'd have to send the, um, the peer ID. The sequence number itself might possibly be reconstructable, but the, the peer ID uh, is not, and we do need that. So that at least would have to be sitting somewhere. and. <laughs> I, well, if it was just the, yeah, if it was just the pure idea, it wouldn't be unique. And also, I don't think you can reconstruct the sequence number. Um, I think you can. I think for a particular client, you can, you can reconstruct it. Um, and if you were, 
listening to everything and you weren't missing messages, then you could reconstruct it for other clients as well. Okay, yeah, I, I, I remain too convinced on that one, but sure. Um, and then another question. I'm not recommending anybody do it, but it seems like in principle you yeah. can. Um, so with the content ranges header, um, I know that Mike had a little like hard coded kind of hacky implementation of content range that you know just worked for the blog by appending to the end. Yeah. Is there actually has anyone written a generic parser for that information that that yet? I've written a generic parser for parsing these things that's sitting in the sync nine code itself. Okay. It, it has a, a parse patch thing. I could pull that out if people want it. I mean, if it's going to be used more widely, like if we're going to be using these content range headers, then I feel like that should just be a standalone NPM module that could be pulled in anywhere, yeah. separate from Sync9 and separate from Brightify even. Um, I agree. Yeah. Um, and then the other other thing about merge type. So this is like taking from inspiration from how I did everything with ShareDB and Saycraft as well. Is like what I'd like to have is I'd like to have, you know, a register method or something. It's like register. You call it register and you say register this merge type, and then here's some code that has a generic function that you know, takes whatever the two pieces of information and turns it to one piece of information, whatever the, the API for that is. And then we can have NPM modules, right? Which are just like, here is the implementation for the auto merge merge type. Um, and then the idea is you just say, require this thing. It adds like, you know, 50K of, of JavaScript code size and then poof, you've got it. And like, in my mind, that's the simple answer that's like correct in all cases. And then we don't have to have any workarounds. Cause it's just like, yep, you just drop that thing and it works and it doesn't have an API. It literally just like, you just drop it in the slot and then, um, and then braid suddenly supports auto merge, merge types. So. But it kind of sounded like you were saying at first is that the header would say merge type auto merge. And then the code would say, oh, merge type auto merge. I don't have that. I'm going to NPM install it so that I have the code. To oh. That could be even even more fun. Uh, <laughs> have a little registry, and then at runtime in the browser, it could just go and fetch the JavaScript code it needs, execute it, and then you know interpret it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could do that. Um, yeah, like it for ShareJS and ShareDB and everything else. The the format I've gone with is just like a register method, and then you know, const type equals require otjson. Um, ShareDB dot register otjson comma you know type like the thing thing you required. And then that's done. And then if you want another type, you just, it's the same thing. Um, you know, or even just like uh, register require the library and then the type node, like the, the library itself knows what its name is and also knows like has the methods it needs. Um, and that's all you need to be able to support whatever arbitrary types you want. Um, and I'd like to have something like that in, again, in WASM as well. So that way we can pull it in on the server side as well easily, even in situations where we're not using JavaScript. Uh, but yeah, but I feel like we've got that then like, yeah, I mean, we could try and solve this stuff with hacky other solutions, but that would just mean that you kind of just don't have to, like, it should be that trivial as a consumer to, to pull that stuff in. Cool. I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but let me know if anybody wants me to pull that back up. Yeah. Nice work there. That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, those are yeah. uh, really good thoughts too. I like your discussion. And we're at two hours now. So oh, yeah. um, if anyone wants to go, here's your free permission. Um, I think I'll be happy to stay on for a little bit to continue talking. And um, also, if anyone has any concluding thoughts, this is a good time for that. Um, I can just say a little bit for myself in conclusion that I'm enjoying these conversations a lot. I'm seeing like a lot of different perspectives that we're bringing together here in synchronization. And I love how we're doing it both at the simple level of building some basic apps and just hacking stuff together, but then also thinking it through to the details of how we get a fully working synchronizer. That's a type, like a, a, an aspect of consciousness that I don't see anywhere else in the programming community. I think it's something unique that we're bringing, but it's right in the middle of all distributed programming. And so if we can lick, if we can figure this out, and make it work, then I just, I feel like there's a lot of potential and it's exciting to me to see a group that we're all, you know, willing to spend these two hours talking about everything and also building code towards it. It feels really good. Hey. All right, let's see you, Dwayne.
We gotta take care. Yeah, take off. Great discussion. <laughs> cool. Take care. See you. I'm, I'd just like to say I'm really enjoying all of the deep diving into the CRDT stuff. Uh, it's like, it's got to be hand in hand with the lower level pieces. It's all got to make sense. And I, I, if I can help in any way, sort of like implementing bits and pieces of that biggest picture, uh, maybe I can offer any feedback loop back into the system. Because I would like to start walking into CRDT territory, I think, now with versions and parents. Does that get me like there? I, I've, I've looked at sequences. Maybe, Greg, I can steal you for a few minutes at some point in the next week. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'm, <clears throat> um, I just had a conversation with somebody else um, who wanted to do a deep dive into like the code of Sync9 to know, because he wants to re-implement Sync9 and Lua, <laughs> of all things, uh, which I totally approve of. I'm a big fan of Lua. Anyway, so if you want to talk, I would, uh, I would love to talk about Once whatever CRDT thing you want. Or when, when we first met in that uh, DWeb post comp meeting, uh, <laughs> you said something about you've implemented sync, like some CRDT in JavaScript, and I was like, oh, well, would would I be able to implement it in Python? And you were like. Oh. Uh, maybe I could implement it in Python, <laughs> talking about yourself. And I don't think you planned on me being here some months later, <laughs> asking you directly. <laughs> but yeah, like I, I've been looking at the current uh, prior art in Python land and it doesn't seem to be much, but I'm studying it intensely and looking at your Sync9. So if yeah. you have a Sync9 walkthrough, I'll be there. Great, well, I could tell you how to implement it in, in Python. If you, <laughs> if you, um... Yeah, if you're, it's, it looks like you're at that at that point. I'd be totally willing to walk you through it. And there's nothing. Uh, Python can do everything necessary for the CRDT side of it. Python has different ways that it works with events and um, networking stuff. But as far as like sync nine is just a pure function, you might say it's not doing anything with networking or like it could be it could sit inside of a wasm module or anything that's a self-contained box it's uh, the simplest saying. kind of yeah anyway so let's set up a set up a time i don't know the best way to do that let me i'm just going to give you my phone number right now because currently that's the only way to contact <laughs> me right now. i'm going to pause oh. recording